All right, so um, we don't have very many class meetings left, right? After today, we're only going to be meeting again three times before the final. Um, so I do want to just get a couple things out of the way today regarding how the next couple of weeks are going to work, right? Um, first, most of you have missed at least one in class writing. So the way we're going to handle this is like so. Um, I will give you the opportunity to make up one in-class writing at home and then turn it into me, right? So you'll get, yeah, so one of, the, I'll send you an email to let you know which ones you've missed. You can pick one to make up and then submit it to me. Um, now, be advised as well that I am going to be looking up these texts on schmoop.com, spark notes, and what have you, right? So that you're not just doing that at home and turning it in. Um, does anybody have any questions about the paper or about the group project? Okay, well, if you do come up with questions, um, the other thing I wanted to note is that I am going to be having extended office hours during the reading days. Um, so I think it's what, um, the week after Thanksgiving, we have class, I think, Monday and Tuesday, right? And then Wednesday and Thursday are reading days. So I will be here all day on Wednesday and Thursday um, with maybe one, two hour period of time blocked off for something else that I need to do. Um, but I'll let you know when that will when that will be right. So I will be here um, all day on the reading days for you to come ask me questions, whatever. Right. Um, right. So I guess that takes care of all of that. Then. Uh, so let's get to the material. Uh, does anybody know who this guy is? Anybody recognize this figure? He is the king of Poland? I, it's uh, whoever colonized like South Africa. I don't uh, know that. Yeah, um, he is an important figure in the history of South African colonization, yeah. But he's not a king of anything. If you don't know who he is, I'm not entirely surprised. He's someone we don't really talk very much about in American history classes, um, even if we're doing you know, world history, European history, whatever, right? This gentleman is one Cecil John Rhodes. How many of you have ever heard of the Rhodes Scholarship? Okay, you, and what, what's, what's the Rhodes Scholarship? How does it work? You have no clue, but you've heard of it, right? And you know it's a big honor to get one, right? It's this you know, very prestigious scholarship that brings students from various parts of the world to study at Oxford, right? Right, Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. A lot of other very important figures in American public life were Rhodes Scholars, right? So really, really top students from America, from Africa, from various parts of Europe and Asia, can get Rhodes, Rhodes scholarships to come and study in England. And this is the guy that the scholarship is named for. Now, this cartoon that depicts him straddling the continent of Africa with wires coming off of his arms and legs um, refers to one of his particular dreams and goals. Right, he wanted to connect all of the British possessions in Africa by rail and with electricity. This was a dream that went unrealized um, in his lifetime. He lived in the later half of the 19th century. He's born in 1853, died in 1902 at the age of 48. So died relatively young. Um, and basically, that's Rhodes's benevolent side. There's a really dark side to Rhodes as well, though. Um, he's born in England. 
he comes to Africa in 1871 to work in the diamond industry. And uh, we're all pretty well aware of how things operate today in the diamond industry in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. It's vicious and exploitative. Um, workers are treated very, very, very badly. The whole industry is really pretty crooked. It was not much different when Rhodes was involved in that industry. Have any of you ever heard of the De Beers Diamond Company? He was, uh, yeah, he was the founder of De Beers. Founded that company in 1888. From 1890 to 1896, he was the Prime Minister of Cape Colony, which was the British part of South Africa. Right? There was, um, before South Africa was a unified independent nation, there was a British colony based around Cape Town called Cape Colony, and there was also a Dutch colony. Um, which I think it was the Free Orange Republic or something. There was something orange in the name. The whole full title escapes me at the moment. Anyway, he was prime minister of the British part of that. And he was a big believer in aggressive British colonial expansion. And by aggressive, I mean both fast and vast and violent. Right? He had a private army that he used to take over a good deal of territory in southeastern Africa. Um, the nations um, that we now call Zimbabwe and Zambia, in 1895, were known as Rhodesia. Right, named for Cecil Rhodes. And Rhodes was a British supremacist, right? He believed that the English people were the best people on earth and had a right to the fruits of the earth. In fact, he, had, uh, he recorded in his last will and testament the following. I contend that we are the first race in the world, meaning the English, and that the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. I contend that every acre added to our territory means the birth of more of the English race who otherwise would not be brought into existence. He also, well, one of the reasons he founded the Rhodes Scholarship was to convince top American students of the rightness of the United States rejoining Great Britain. That the whole purpose of the Rhodes Scholarship was to promote British interests abroad, right, to get foreign students to identify with Britain and with a particular definition of Englishness as a whole. So Rhodes has become a really, really controversial figure, particularly in South Africa and the former Rhodesian colonies, and in England as well. There are a number of uh, students uh, in England who are uncomfortable with the name and expressed aim of the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, there have been a lot of protest, campus protests in South Africa, um, students who want statues of Cecil Rhodes removed from university campuses, references to Rhodes removed uh, from university buildings, um, and an acknowledgement of his legacy that does not simply celebrate him as a hero. Right? This is a figure who's not read the same way by the white and black populations of South Africa. Yeah, Ashley. So it's kind of like what's happening with Cecil Rogue at Ro Rhodes mm -hmm. in, Eng in Africa is kind of like what's happening in the U.S. with yeah. the Christopher Columbus? Sure, with figures like Christopher Columbus or with John C. Calhoun or Andrew Jackson. Um, you know, these famous figures from American history who also have these troubled legacies when it comes to race relations. And, you know, Rhodes was somebody who did work aggressively to try to marginalize politically, economically, and geographically the indigenous populations um, of southern Africa. So 
Yeah, um, we this is part of a world. This is part of a worldwide movement, sort of as you know. Yeah, we've got similar things going on here. Uh, there are similar issues going on in England as well. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Rhodes is the founder of the colony that the narrator of this particular story grows up in, um, and his story provides perspective on a certain kind of settler mentality. Right. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, the dark continent, used to describe Africa? Yes. Okay, a couple of you, right? I remember like, even when I was a kid in the 80s, the Bush Gardens theme park in Tampa, Florida, that was Africa-themed, called itself the dark continent. Right? While the Williamsburg, Virginia one that was Europe-themed called itself the old country. It's the only place in the world where England is adjacent to Italy um, and where the Eng Irish pub only serves Budweiser products, but I digress. <laughs> yeah, this idea of the dark continent, right, suffuses British writing about Africa in the 19th and early 20th centuries, right? Now, by the dark continent, what they mean is a couple of different things. On the one hand, they're viewing the African landscape as largely kind of empty, right? Devoid of what they would regard as civilization. They're also viewing the landscape as unknown, unmapped, right? This is what they really need by Dark Continent, right? It's like, how many of you have ever played um, a video game where I think there's an effect called Fog of War, mm -hmm. where like, uh, you know, you can't actually see a region until you've actually gone into it? Yeah, 19th century British writing about Africa tended to regard the continent in the same way, right? As this sort of, this impenetrable darkness that they had no insight into, right? And you couldn't actually see any of it until you stepped into it. So, yeah, yeah, let's bring World of Warcraft into everything. Um, more, like, more like a civilization, yeah. Or, yeah, civilization works the same way. Yeah, you can, right, you, God, civilization is actually a colonization game. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that just broke my brain and my heart. All right, thank you. So, third issue here. There was a sense... of spiritual danger in much British writing about Africa as well. Have any of you ever read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness? Any of you read it in high school or another class? Yeah. Okay, you know Heart of Darkness, right? So how does Conrad treat, like what happens to people who spend too much time in Africa in that novel? They die. <laughs> they die. Horribly. Yeah, horribly after succumbing to a kind of madness, right? The continent infuses the civilized European with this kind of primitive madness. That's yucky. Yeah, and you know, it, it's, it's one of, it, it's, Heart of Darkness is one of those kind of difficult novels. Like on the one hand it is, it's both beautiful and repellent at the same time. Uh, it's racial politics are really backwards and repellent, um, but, yeah, that's, that's really all I'm going to say about that. Let's not get into defending this, right? But the sense of danger that, that the continent represents, right? you're going into the unknown, and you could very well get sucked in by it, right? So this is how the average British administrator, the average British citizen regarded the African landscape as this sort of blank slate to which you could send missionaries, merchants, and soldiers in the service of both expanding British civilization and expanding the reach of industrial capitalism. Right. When Rhodes, for example, went into Rhodesia, he wasn't looking to save anyone's souls. 
In fact, he by and large uses private armies to move the indigenous population off of valuable lands. What he was looking to do was get access to mineral resources. So a lot of these colonies were run not actually directly by the British Crown, by the British government, but by private corporations. And one of the ways they figured out to get people off the land solved another problem for Britain on the home front, right? So we're seeing mass settlements, well, relatively mass settlements, increased settlements of Britons in southern Africa, southeastern Africa, in the 1920s and the 1930s. Does anybody have, have any idea why that would be? What the country was looking to do, or who they were looking to get rid of? Early 1920s, what might they have a surplus, what might Britain have had a surplus of hanging around? Munitions? Pardon? Munitions? Um, munitions? No, no, munitions? No, no. Um, it, it's the, uh, they don't actually have a, it's not actually a surplus of weaponry that they have lying around. But I think you're thinking along the right lines, right? It's not, it, we're talking about a different kind of military resource they have a lot of lying around. What ended in 1918? World War I. Yeah. So there were a lot of unemployed, war veterans hanging around England with nothing to do. So this was a sort of safety valve for releasing those people as well, right? You start settle, you encourage these war veterans to settle and farm in Southern Africa and then they're no longer a burden on the British welfare state. Right, you don't have to pay their upkeep anymore. And you get the benefit that they're taking out, they're moving into and taking over new territory for you. Right, so yeah, the, many of these Rhodesian farmers, like the narrator's father here, would have been war veterans. Um, in fact, Lessing's own father um, was a veteran who had lost his leg um, in the war. Um, he had no idea how to farm. Most of these guys had no idea how to farm. But in a lot of ways, the farming itself wasn't the point. It was getting them out of England and onto this other land. So, <clears throat> as far as Les Doris Lessing's own family history is concerned, right? In 1925, her father attends one of these colonial exhibitions in London. And we've already seen what a huge influence on a person's psyche these can be, right? This is what inspired M.A. Césaire to start writing against his colonial condition. This is what inspired uh, F.T. Marinetti to start imagining people fused with machines, right? These kinds of expositions happened fairly frequently, um, and everyone went to them. So Lessing's father learns at this colonial exhibition that the government is paying war veterans a certain amount of money, is willing to grant them a certain amount of land to go out and farm in Rhodesia. So he immediately takes them up on it, moves his family out there. And the conditions they encounter um, are not entirely promising. If we look at this particular story, how is the farm itself described? Does it look like it's a successful farming operation? No. Yeah, what's, <clears throat> why not? What's that? Okay, yeah, badly, right. The land is described as badly cultivated. 
What else suggests to us that this is an unsuccessful farm? How much of the land they have do they actually use? They were good the years of ranging the bush over her father's farm, which, like every white farm, was largely unused, broken only occasionally by small patches of cultivation. Right, so they're, they own a lot of land, but there are only little bits of it that they actually grow anything on. What do we know about the way her father regards his financial situation? Um, uh, the, the Native Africans think he's rich for owning that much land, but mm -hmm. he's not. Yeah, or at least he certainly doesn't regard himself as rich, right? So we have a power structure that doesn't necessarily depend on actual material wealth. So we'll get to that in a minute, right? But yeah, he regards himself as poor, right? Because he's thinking of himself in regards to other Britons, in regards to other white people, right? So this is an unsuccessful farm. Um, this is a largely sort of, uh, this is mostly uncultivated land. And what about their workforce? Their native. Yeah, workforce is, mo workforce is almost entirely indigenous, changes a lot. And do they seem to differentiate between members of their workforce? How easy is it for them to tell different people who work for them apart? It's not. They describe them as blurred faces. Mm -hmm. Blurred faces. People who by and large simply come and go. All right, look on page 719. The black people on the farm were as remote as the trees and the rocks. They were an amorphous black mass, mingling and thinning and massing like tadpoles, faceless, who existed merely to serve, to say, yes, boss, take their money and go. They changed season by season, moving from one farm to the next, according to their outlandish needs, which one did not have to understand, coming from perhaps hundreds of miles north or east, passing on after a few months where? Perhaps even as far away as the fabled gold mines of Johannesburg, where the pay was so much better than the few shillings a month and the double handful of mealy meal twice a day, which they earned in that part of Africa. So by and large, this farm is just a place where workers stop on their way to potentially better paying jobs somewhere else, right? They work here for a few seasons to make enough money to get themselves someplace else, anywhere, right? Where they go, where they end up, the farmers don't really care or notice. So what about the girl's attachment to the landscape she's grown up in. How does she see the world around her, at least initially? She's very ignorant and I think scared a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's different from what she's used to. Well, really though, this it is what she's used to. Oh, she's I mean, ever, yeah, it's all she's ever known. Yeah, I mean, it's just... I, I kind of get the feeling that she's a little bit like in love with it. And mm -hmm. she feels like it's like her world and she kind of mm -hmm. pushes out the native people because that's all she really mm -hmm. knows. She's kind of in control. Mm -hmm. People listen to her. Is she always in love with it? No. How does she seem to regard the landscape at the beginning of the story? Violent. Why would you say violent, James? Yeah. Because when, you, when she was like describing it, mm -hmm. it looked like, and then when I was reading it off my head, it looked like it was just patchy grass that was dying in some spots that hadn't been tended, mm -hmm. and then just a bunch of plants that had thorns. Like right. Every plant seemed to have a thorn. Okay, Masasa said the thorn, yeah, these are trees. Right, these are trees that are native uh, to that part of Africa. <laughs> If you look on page 718, right, we have jutting, a jutting piece of rock 
which had been thrust up from the warm soil of Africa unimaginable eras of time ago, washed into hollows and whirls by the sun and wind that had traveled so many thousands of miles of space and bush, would hold the weight of a small girl whose eyes were sightless for anything but a pale willowed river, a pale gleaming castle. Right, so she is climbing up on this unimaginably ancient piece of rock jutting up out of the land, but she has no appreciation for the rock itself, right? Or for how ancient it is, right? It holds her weight while she dreams of pale willowed rivers and pale gleaming oak castles. Now, do we typically find pale willowed rivers or pale gleaming castles in Africa? No. Yeah, th this is a European landscape that she is imagining. So is that what her children's books were about, the English landscapes and sure. fantasy? Yeah, um, let's, yeah, um, let's, yeah, actually, can you, can you just uh, keep reading for us there? Yeah, um, her books have tales of alien fairies, mm -hmm. her rivers can slow and um, ran slow and peaceful, and she knew the shape of the leaves of an ash or an oak, the names of the little creatures that lived in English streams, when the words the veld meant strangeness, but she could remember nothing else. Yeah, the veld, the fields around her house, this is all she's ever known. This is the only place she's ever been, but her imagination is wrapped up in a place she's never seen, right? because all of her fairy tales, right, the stories that she's getting come from England, right? This is one of the reasons I was playing that English band, dance band music for you, right? By and large, the settlers in these places would not be trying to learn very much about the indigenous culture. They would try to have as little contact with it as possible and would sort of promote a sense of Britishness, um, you know, within themselves, Right, as sort of armor against fear, as she puts it here. And almost as a sort of triumphalism sometimes. Um, so, yeah, the landscape she imagines is an, is an English landscape, a European landscape. And she's reading that onto the African landscape she grows up in, right? Pushing her way through green aisles of the mealy stalks, the leaves arching like cathedrals, veined with sunlight far overhead, with the packed red earth underfoot, a fine lace of red starred witchweed would summon up a black bent figure croaking premonitions. The northern witch, bred of cold northern forests, would stand before her among the mealy fields, and it was the mealy fields that faded and fled, leaving her among the gnarled roots of an oak, snow falling thick and soft and white, the woodcutter's fire glowing red welcome through the crowding tree trunks, right? Even the danger she senses is from European fairy tales, right? Oh, I see a witch off in the darkness. Right? I better run to this woodcutter's cottage for warmth, right? The idea of, you know, like running to a woodcutter's cottage in the snow for someone like her is, you know, right, kind of absurd. She lives someplace where it doesn't snow. This is one of the reasons why I always, I always get nervous down here whenever there's any ice on the roads, right? On those rare occasions when it's, it's like, where I grew up happens all the time, right? Halloween, we trick-or-treated in parkas. Um, down here, you put a little ice on the road, people don't really know what to do with it. <laughs> and it's scary. But what... <clears throat> What's going on here, it also reflects the way colonial education systems worked. Um, if you meet people from India, from certain parts of Africa, from parts of the Caribbean, who grew up in an English-based schooling system, a lot, of them will, I, a lot of them will really, really hate daffodils because they were forced to read as children these William Wordsworth poems about flowers they had no concept of, right? Flowers they'd never seen, were never likely to see, and told by their teachers how great these damn flowers were. Right, similar sort of consciousness at work here, right? How does she start to come to, con to a consciousness 
of her actual surroundings. Well, is she aware of her, is she becoming more aware of her surroundings before she meets the chief? Yes. Yeah, she is going off and exploring, right? She's wandering around these kaffir paths. Which are primarily what the indigenous population uses uh, to get around, right? These sort of informal um, highway networks. People just traverse on foot. Now the word kaffir um, is, I can't remember off the top of my head if it comes from Arabic or from Hindi. It comes from one or the other. Um, if this is something you care about, you can go ahead and look it up. Um, anyway, know that it comes from one of those languages. And it means stranger or alien. So the paths that the indigenous population used to get around are called stranger paths, right? Foreigner paths, alien paths. You see anything a little bit disconcerting about that? They're calling them the strangers in their own country. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are here first. We're calling them aliens. We're calling them strangers. How does she behave with people she meets on these Kaffir paths? She usually has her dogs chasing away. Okay, yep, she's got dogs and a gun. And she often will have the dogs chase the person up a tree. Right? If a native came into sight along the Kaffir paths half a mile away, the dogs would flush him up a tree as if he were a bird. If he expostulated in his uncouth language, which was by itself ridiculous, that was cheek. If one was in a good mood, it could be a matter for laughter. Otherwise, one passed on, hardly glancing at the angry man in the tree. On the rare occasions when white children met together, they could amuse themselves by hailing a passing native in order to make a buffoon of him. They could set the dogs on him and watch him run. They could tease a small black child as if he were a puppy, save that they would not throw stones and sticks at a dog without a sense of guilt. So what do the settler children treat the indigenous people as, by and large? What, what are they for them? Less than animals. Yeah, um, less than animals. Right? Certainly, yeah, they, they feel less bad about teasing an African than they do about teasing a puppy. Why do they tease the African in the first place? What are they looking for? Entertainment, yeah, it's for amusement. Right? These people are a source of amusement. We can see a similar line of reasoning at work when the girl's mother finds out that her cook is the chief's son. Or if we look on page 719, not 719, what happened? 721, right? Then one day something new happened. Working in our house as servants were always three natives, cook, houseboy, garden boy. They used to change as the farm natives changed, staying for a few months, then moving on to a new job or back home to their crawls. They were thought of as good or bad natives, which meant, how did they behave as servants? Were they lazy, efficient, obedient, or disrespectful? If the family felt good humored, the phrase was, what can you expect from raw black savages? So how do they rate their indigenous workers? Okay, as savages, right? You know, well, what can you expect? But when deciding whether or not one is a good or bad worker, right, what is, what's the only thing they're concerned about? Whether or not their performance as a worker, their performance yeah. as a servant. Yeah, they're only interested in how this person performs some function that is useful to them, right? They're interested not in their servants as people by and large, but in their usefulness just as the children are interested in the indigenous people primarily as a source of amusement. No one thinks of them as people. Right. Yeah, no one really treats them like people with individual 
personalities, individual desires, individual thoughts. One day a white policeman was on his rounds in the district and he said laughingly, did you know you have an important man in your kitchen? What, explained my mother sharply, what do you mean? A chief's son, the policeman seemed amused. He'll boss the tribe when the old man dies. He better not put on a chief's son act with me, said my mother. So does the mother care at all what the cook's status is among his own people? No. Doesn't matter. All that matters is that he's her cook. And as such, he'd better behave himself. He'd better do his job, be quiet about it, not complain. So yeah, the indigenous population are sources of amusements, sources of labor. Nothing more. They come and go. Not all that worried about them. So how does the encounter with the chief then change the girl's perspective? What's our first indication of a change in perspective here? Is there um, a linguistic shift? The way they talk to each other. Like, at first she's mm -hmm. kind of rude, and then she, she started being more polite. Mm -hmm. um, Like, okay. When he, he was kind to her at first, and mm -hmm. she, she decided not to chase him with her. Right. Just his approach to her changing mm -hmm. perspective on yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess let me rephrase this question slightly, though. So in the language of the text, in the way the narrator refers to herself, do we notice a difference from this episode onward? She... She shifts to I. She refers to herself as herself. Yeah. First two pages are all third person, right? As though she's talking about a different person. So yeah, we get a shift here from third person, right, as she imagines uh, or reimagines her childhood. And starting with the encounter with the chief, she shifts to first person. Good. And yeah, and as you guys noted, yeah, the... <laughs> is this yours or yours? It's mine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the, as you guys noted, in the encounter with the chief, right, the chief is polite to her even though she is initially rude and a little bit threatening to him, right? What's her initial response to him? What does she initially expect when she meets this guy? She's yeah. Why the hell isn't this guy getting out of my way? Right? They always get out of my way. Right? I've got a gun. I've got dogs. Why is this guy standing here? Yeah. Well, yeah. This is my right. This is my land. But the chief does not move. Right in front of me, perhaps a couple hundred yards away, a group of three Africans came into sight around the side of a big ant heap. I whistled the dogs close into my skirts and let the gun swing in my hand and advanced, waiting for them to move aside off the path in respect for my passing. But they came on steadily, and the dogs looked up at me for the command to chase. I was angry. It was cheek for a native not to stand off a path the moment he caught sight of you. She keeps using this word cheek. What does she mean by this? Disrespectful, cheeky. Yeah, it's disrespect, it's cheek, for this person not to acknowledge my superior standing. Right. She assumes her superiority over anyone she meets on these paths. And, you know, in a sense, how can she know any better, right? How do the servants treat her on the farm? Like the chieftainess, they call her. Yeah, they call her chieftainess. And she drops a book, a servant will come running from 100 yards to pick it up. And her mother does not let her mix with the indigenous people at all, right? Her only relationship 
with Africans is a master-servant relationship. She has never been permitted or encouraged to meet with any of them on any sort of terms of equality. In front walked an old man, stooping his weight onto a stick, his hair grizzled white, a dark red blanket slung over his shoulders like a cloak. Behind him came two men, carrying bundles of pots, asagais, hatchets. The group was not a usual one. They were not natives seeking work. These had an air of dignity of quietly following their own purpose. It was that the dignity that checked my tongue. I walked quietly on, talking softly to the growling dogs till I was ten paces away. Then the old man stopped, drawing his blanket close. So we see this is someone who is not looking to relate to her in the usual way, right? She notes, right, these are not people looking for work. Almost all of the natives who come to the farm are people who are looking for a job. She's not used to dealing with somebody who's not looking for work, who's not putting themselves in that submissive position, right? I mean, you know, you interview for a job, you're applying for a job, you are essentially putting yourself in someone else's power. That's what she's accustomed to. But these people are not doing this. They have their own purpose in mind. Morning, Kosikasi said, using the customary greeting for any time of day. Good morning, I said. Where are you going? My voice was a little truculent. The old man spoke in his own language. Then one of the young men stepped forward politely and said in careful English, my chief travels to see his brothers beyond the river. A chief, I thought, understanding the pride that made the old man stand before me like an equal, more than an equal, for he showed courtesy and I showed none. The old man spoke again, wearing dignity like an inherited garment, still standing ten paces off, flanked by his entourage, not looking at me, that would have been rude, but directing his eyes somewhere over my head at the trees. So he wears his dignity like an inherited garment. Why do you think she refers to his attitude, his composure, his dignity, as being like an inherited garment? Why focus on heritage? Because this was his land before it was theirs. Mm -hmm. This was the old chief's country. This was his land before it was theirs. And then there is the issue as well of the son's inheritance, right? And of this heritage of, chief, of chieftaincy, right? Basically, what has he got left? Yeah, the title and the dignity. That's largely all that's left of it. He was a powerful and important man. And now he's reduced to one small... The village is, you know, it's a nice village. It's well kept. It's well cared for. Apparently well run. But that's all he's got left. He's been crowded off of land that was once his, that once belonged to his people, by people like the chieftainess, like the little chieftainess's father. And if you look on page 721, as she starts looking up, Chief Mishlonga in his history, right? Not long afterwards, I read in an old explorer's book the phrase, Chief Mishlonga's country. It went like this. Our destination was Chief Mishlanga's country to the north of the river. It was our desire to ask his permission to prospect for gold in his territory. The phrase, ask his permission, was so extraordinary to a white child, it brought, uh, brought up to consider all natives as thing to things to use, that it revived those questions which could not be suppressed. They fermented slowly in my mind. On another occasion, one of those old prospectors who still move over Africa looking for neglected reefs with their hammers and tents and pans for sifting gold from crushed rock, came to the farm and in taking of the old day and talking of the old days, used that phrase again. 
This was the old chief's country, he said. It stretched from those mountains over there way back to the river, hundreds of miles of country. That was his name for our district, the old chief's country. He did not use our name for it, a new phrase which held no implication of usurped ownership. Right. The territory she lives in right, is called Rhodesia, named for the guy who took it over. No reference to the people who were there before. No suggestion of who this used to belong to. As I read more books about the time when this part of Africa was opened up, not much more than 50 years before, I found Old Chief Mishlonga had been a famous man known to all the explorers and prospectors, but then he had been young. Or maybe it was his father or uncle they spoke of, I never found out. So this phrase again, like the idea of Africa being opened up, right, even as we sort of, we have this girl sort of trying to, you know, trying to, you know, get woke, right, trying to understand the issues of the indigenous population, she's still using a phrase like Africa being opened up. Right. How is she still thinking of Africa? As something that had been undiscovered. Yeah, it's still that dark continent mentality, right? This idea that there wasn't anything there before. That it was just sort of a blank mass that European powers could project their civilization onto. And we see much of this same attitude as she's traveling to the village. Right, she's following the chief's son out to the village. If you look on page 722. Beyond our boundaries on that side, the country was new to me. I followed unfamiliar paths past copias that till now had been part of the jagged horizon, hazed with distance. This was government land, which had never been cultivated by white men. At first, I could not understand why it was that it appeared, in merely crossing the boundary, I had emptied, entered a completely fresh type of landscape. It was a wide green valley, where a small river sparkled, and vivid water birds darted over the rushes. The grass was thick and soft to my calves. The trees stood tall and shapely. Once she's beyond the boundaries of her farm, how does this land look compared to the farm? It's beautiful. Yeah, this is fertile and lush and green and lovely, right? As opposed to the relatively desiccated, desultory little farm that she lives on. I was used to our farm, whose hundreds of acres of harsh eroded soil bore trees that had been cut for the mine furnaces and had grown thin and twisted, where the cattle dragged the grass flat, leaving innumerable crisscrossing trails that deepened each season into gullies under the force of rain. So the cattle raising, and the cutting of trees for the mine furnaces right, are indicators that the primary purpose of her father's farm is capitalistic. Right? We're raising beef for exports. We're cutting trees in order to sell to the miners for their furnaces. Right? Their primary interest is profit. In Chief Mishlanga's village, on the other hand, right, we have a cluster of thatched huts and a clearing among trees. There were neat patches of mealies and pumpkins and millet, and cattle grazed under some trees at a distance. Fowls scraped, scratched among the huts, dogs lay sleeping on the grass, and goats freezed a copia that jutted up beyond a tributary of the river, lying like an enclosing arm around the village. Right, all of the farming activity seems like a natural part of the rhythms of the place. Right? It's not the same level of environmental destruction that the narrator's father is engaged in. Right? The difference being that Chief Mishlanga's people are raising these things by and large for themselves. Right? We know, for example, they don't want to sell the goats Right, the goats are a food source they depend on. But as far as the land between 
the farm and the village is concerned here. Right, this country had been left untouched, save for prospectors whose picks had struck a few sparks from the surface of the rocks as they wandered by, and for migrant natives whose passing had left, perhaps, a charred patch on the trunk of a tree where their evening fire had nestled. It was very silent, a hot morning with pigeons cooing throatily, the midday shadows lying dense and thick with clear yellow spaces of sunlight between, and in all that wide green park-like valley, not a human soul but myself. I was listening to the quick regular tapping of a woodpecker when slowly a chill feeling seemed to grow up from the small of my back to my shoulders. In a constricting spasm like a shudder, at the roots of my hair a tingling sensation began and ran down the surface of my flesh, leaving me goose-fleshed and cold, though I was damp with sweat. Fever? I thought, then uneasily, turned to look over my shoulder and realized suddenly that this was fear. It was extraordinary, even humiliating. It was a new fear. For all the years I had walked by myself over this country, I had never known a moment's uneasiness. In the beginning, because I had been supported by a gun and the dogs, then because I had learned an easy friendliness for the Africans I might encounter. So the further she gets from familiar territory, from the farm she grew up on, the further she gets from that boundary that separates her father's land from the land surrounding, the more afraid she gets, the more frightened she gets. Now, how far is she actually from home, as we're told? Not too far. Yeah, she's less than 10 miles from her house, right? She has not gone. Actually, she's actually gone for, you know, for a little girl on foot in <laughs> a pretty amazing distance. But she's still within the orbit of the farm she grew up on, right? But the land here is so different from what she's used to, it's terrifying to her. The further she gets from that little farm, the more afraid she gets. And when she gets to the village, how is she, uh, how is she welcomed? What sort of reception does she receive? Yeah, they're confused and afraid, right? I mean, what has it typically meant for these people, we can imagine, when a white person shows up in their village? Devastation. Yeah, this means you're going to get moved, right? And she doesn't realize it, but she is the harbinger of exactly that. Not too long after her visit, they are going to get moved off of their land, sent someplace else. She doesn't mean it. She's curious. She wants to make a connection. But she's gone to a place where she's not, where history makes her unwelcome. Right. It's okay for them to meet on the Kaffir paths. Why is it okay for them to meet on the Kaffir paths? Because she's greater than them and they're lesser. Well, the, I mean, she's not treating people like that anymore at this point, right? Sure. She's nice to people she meets on the Kaffir paths now, right? But how are the Kaffir paths different from the farm or the village? They're within the bounds of like Rhodesia. Like she went off mm -hmm. her family's path. She went off her family's farm mm -hmm. and went into like government territory where they right. live. Well, and technically the Kaffir paths are, they're around the farm, but not of it, right? The indigenous people use the Kaffir paths freely. And so does she. So what does that indicate to us about them? That both the white settlers and the indigenous people use the Kaffir paths freely. What kind of territory is that then? Yeah, this is neutral space, right? This is space that belongs to everybody. So in that way, like the stranger or alien space actually becomes appropriate, right? On these paths, everybody's a stranger. Everybody's an alien. Everybody uses them. You can meet people more or less as equals here. But in the village or at the farmhouse, you can't, right? That's dominated space. That's controlled space. Now, there's another thing to note about the village as well. What's largely missing from the village when she gets there? Men. Yeah, hardly any young men, right? She says, this is a village of ancients and children and women. 
Even the two young men who kneeled beside the chief were not those I had seen with him previously. The young men were all working on the white men's farms and mines, and the chief must depend on relatives who were temporarily on holiday for his attendance. So this is another way in which the rhythms of capitalism have disrupted the traditional lives of this community. Right? All of the young men who would normally be around attending the chief or you know, raising crops, working in the village, are instead working for pay on farms or in mines, right? working for white men. Now we're running a little bit short on time, but there is one last episode I really do want to focus on here. Um, what do you make of the last confrontation here at the end of this between the narrator's father and the chief? If you the chief Yeah, the father does not care about the effect taking the goats will have on the chief, right? He is insistent that he has a right to the goats. Why? Because they're on his land. Right, because the goats trespassed on private property and trampled some of his land, right? Now, we also know that most of his land is basically worthless. He doesn't regard it as such, right? But, right, this concept of private property is one that Chief Mishlanga doesn't really share, right? The village has property that is shared in common, right? This idea of goats coming in and trampling, wait, wait, so my people's goats came and trampled your land so you can take them? Like, to him seems bizarre. So he's being forced to participate in a legal system that he doesn't understand and that is not native to his place. Right. In his dealings with British subjects, he is forced to deal with the British legal system. What do we notice about the positioning of people here as well? The way people are sitting in relation to each other. We look on page 725. He arrived now at our house at the time of sunset one evening, looking very old and bent now, walking stiffly under his regally draped blanket, leaning on a big stick. My father sat himself down in his big chair below the steps of the house. The old man squatted carefully on the ground before him, flanked by his two young men. So who's seated where in relation to who? He's kind of seated above, so he's yeah. down. He's sitting in a big chair above the indigenous people in front of him who are squatting on the ground, right? So he's placing himself above them physically. They can't really communicate with each other. They don't understand each other's dialects. And why is it a final triumph for the father when he says, go to the police then? The police aren't going to help him. Exactly. The police aren't going to do anything for Chief Mishlanga's people, right? One of the senses we get from <clears throat> the interactions of white people with each other in the story is that they tend to stick together, right? So <clears throat> this was actually sort of one of the common illusions of settler society, right? This idea that the white people all stuck together and were more, saw themselves as more or less on the same level. They didn't, but they often promoted the idea that they did. So the chief and his people get moved off their land. All right, sometime later, page 726, we heard that Chief Mishlanga and his people had been moved 200 miles east to a proper native reserve. The government land was going to be opened up for white settlements soon. I went to see the village again about a year afterwards. There was nothing there. Mounds of red mud where the, huts, where the huts had been had long swaths of rotting thatch over them, veined with the red galleries of the white ants. The pumpkin vines rioted everywhere, over the bushes, up the lower branches of trees so that the great golden balls rolled underfoot and dangled overhead. It was a festival of pumpkins. The bushes were crowding up, the new grass sprang vivid green. 
The settler lucky enough to be allotted the Lushmore Valley, if he chose to cultivate this particular section, would find suddenly, in the middle of a mealy field, the plants were growing 15 feet tall, the weight of the cobs dragging at the stalks and wondering what unexpected vein of richness he had struck. So this land that the chief and his people carefully cultivated for generations is going to be allotted to some lucky settler who was going to get all of this abundance without having had to work for it. So we'll just leave that, we're out of time, so we'll just sort of leave that as the final note on this. Um, we're going to be looking next time at poetry that addresses history and conflict um, in Israel and Palestine. So let me just put reading questions up for you. And make sure you turn in your in-class writings as you leave, and then you are free to go. See you Thursday.